and Acts. We are still in our introductory phase for this. We uh, are going today to do a quick review of uh, Romans, as is my custom to do a short review before we move into the next section. And when we do that, we're going to uh, get back to what we couldn't get last week because of time constraints, the look at the synagogue. The synagogue is mentioned in the Gospels and Acts about 65 times. It's also in the book of Revelation, and it is never found in the mystery writings of Paul. It is uh, found in the book of James, however, the passage uh, in James 2.2 2 where uh, he says to them, if a rich man comes into your synagogue, so uh, of course uh, we've already established that the book of James is written to the Jews, it's, there are multiple evidences that it is, and that's another confirmation that it is, since he calls uh, tells them they're meeting in, in their synagogues. So that's uh, why we're going to look at synagogues, because it's going to come up, uh, as I said, 60, well, 50 sometimes, 50, uh, no, about 40 sometimes in the Gospels, and it plays an important role in the Gospels, as does everything uh, related to Judaism play important roles in the uh, Gospels and in the book of Acts. So let's see if we can get this to work. I am assuming everyone is hearing me okay. I appear to be on. Still. Okay, Understanding the Gospels and Acts, Lesson 10, the Synagogue and the Isagogics of Romans. I didn't uh, get to complete the look at the synagogue last week when we were looking at the Book of Romans, uh, but it's important to understand some of the passages in Romans, though I'm not going to specifically look at them in any detail today. Uh, there are several passages one that we're all familiar with is the passage to honor the government, uh, to do what the government says uh, to do. Well, people have mistaken that for the government of your country uh, when actually it is the governing body of the synagogue. So that should give you a, a little insight into the significance of the isagogics of uh, what is going on in the original language when you have the correct understanding of what is referenced. Uh, we'll see in our study of the synagogue uh, the leadership and how all of the administration in the synagogue works. Let's begin with a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to meet and to study your word, our the word of our life, and uh, we thank you that you have given us the ability to meet the way we do now with uh, uh, technology so that those who cannot come together into one place are able to, to, to still study your word. We ask that you bless the teaching and the studying and learning today so that we might understand more clearly your word, so that we might more clearly be able to establish your word as our means of life in, our, uh, in the way we carry out ourselves to, uh, at this time. We thank you again for uh, the meeting. We pray for our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are suffering persecution in their lands for their faith in you and your son, and we ask your blessing on them. Uh, we ask this all uh, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. We do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might, be, you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, 
and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's pretty much what I prayed, isn't it? <laughs> the body of Christ, for by grace are you saved, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 say, through faith, and that not of yourselves. Salvation is the gift of God, not as a result of good deeds that you do so that no one may boast. This verse will come up uh, later in our study, and I'll uh, try to bring up reference to it when we get to that point. So far, we have looked at the foundation of confusion by highlighting some of the building blocks in that foundation. Hermeneutical failure, hard sayings, the law, anti-Semitism of the church fathers, and in the last three weeks, we looked at the failure to rightly divide. Let me move this thing out of our way here again and see if I can get it so it'll stay out of our way. To uh, the failure to rightly divide the scripture. Specifically, we looked at the prophetic scriptures of the Tanakh compared to the mystery gospel of Paul. We've only covered a few of them. There are multiple, uh, but we, uh, we've seen enough. I hope that I've been able to establish that there is a difference between Paul's writings in Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon, 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. That those, those scriptures written by Paul are totally different than the scriptures relating the life ministry of Yahusha HaMashiach, the Messiah of Israel, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, it's also different than the messages of the book of Acts. Uh, we've seen that. And in fact, we have seen not only that, uh, as I have here at the last uh, sentence, uh, we've seen that gospel, the gospel that Paul preached throughout the book of Acts was also the kingdom gospel. And it was only after the book of Acts, approximately two years later, that he wrote the mystery gospels, that he started writing the mystery gospels. So he obviously would have been teaching them prior to that time, but none of that is recorded for us in the historical uh, book of Acts. We uh, will see some more differences when we are looking at the uh, Gospels in detail, which hopefully will start next week, if everything goes well this week. We'll look at the uh, scriptures in the Gospels that lay out the requirements of the kingdom Gospel for those uh, participants and the recipients of the message. And uh, perhaps this is a good time to do a little bit of overview uh, there have been typically named seven dispensations throughout the history of God's dealing with humanity on the earth. Uh, I have added one that um, I have seen one or two places that it was uh, interjected, but the gospel of the kingdom, remember, starting in, uh, with Luke 16.16, 16, when Jesus said that uh, the law and the prophets were until John the Baptist and then the kingdom. And uh, another passage there after John was uh, murdered uh, says that uh, after John was killed, that Jesus said, uh, the now is the time, the gospel, the kingdom of God, is kingdom from heaven in Matthew's gospel, the kingdom from heaven is at hand. Here it is. And that's the offering stage of the gospel of the kingdom. It continued from, the, from that point on in the ministry of Yahusha on the earth in the hypostatic union, continued on through the remainder of the gospels, and through the book of Acts all the way to uh, until the end of the book of Acts. That was the offering of the gospel. That then uh, continued on until 70 A.D. My, my understanding of this, and I haven't really found any authors who, who teach this, um, I, I did see one reference to it, 
that the kingdom offer was still good until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. and the, the destruction of the temple. Uh, I believe it was for this purpose that upon the rejection of Messiah in 30 A.D. Uh, by the murder of Messiah, uh, it signified that they would have one generation or 40 years to uh, repent and come to their Messiah, much like the 40 years in the desert and other 40-year uh, time frames in the scriptures uh, as a time of testing. So I think that that's why it was uh, still available for 40 years. We know that it was still available because uh, Peter, James, and John still, and Jude still uh, talked about it uh, until that time, and then we don't know what happened after the death of John as far as the gospel of the, of the kingdom, but we do know that all traces of it disappeared, and there was no more discussion about it uh, from that point on. Maybe a couple of things uh, all the way up to about 50 years after the death of John. And uh, John died in about 100 AD. So there was some left, uh, some, some kingdom, uh, as those people who were part of the kingdom died out. Remember, everyone who was saved during the kingdom gospel period was saved. They are part of the remnant that will, uh, during the resurrection that takes place at the second coming, will be resurrected and uh, may well serve as witnesses during that time. We don't know. Uh, I don't, I've not found that in the book of Revelation yet or uh, uh, any other places. Uh, there are prophetic scriptures in the, in the uh, prophets of the, of the Old Testament that talk, talk about uh, Gentiles grabbing the hem of the garment of a Jew saying, uh, we know that you know God, take us to him. So there will be that sort of a ministry, but I don't know that I found anything that indicates that that is the remnant that was saved during the offering of the kingdom gospel. The kingdom gospel is on hold now. The kingdom offering is on hold. It will begin again during the tribulation period. That will be the revitalization or the revision of the uh, gospel of the kingdom for the Jews, and then, of course, at the second coming, Christ will establish the kingdom for the Jews and uh, set it up for a thousand years and then on into eternity future. Last week, we saw the epistle to the Romans was written to unbelieving Jews, believing Jews, and believing Greeks. Paul's presentation was mixed with parts sounding Christian to us, but other parts sounding like law to those of the legalistic persuasion, and that in chapter 2, like this, starting with verse 5. But according to your hardness and your unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of Elohim, who shall render to each one according to his works everlasting life to those who by persistence in good work seek for esteem, and respect and incorruptibility, but wrath and displeasure to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. Certainly this uh, does not sound like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, right? Uh, this is nothing but about works, not about faith alone in Christ alone. It continues, affliction and distress on every human being working what is evil, of the Yehudite first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with Elohim, for as many as sinned without Torah shall also perish without Torah, and as many as sinned in the Torah shall be judged by the Torah. For not the hearers of the Torah are righteous in the sight of Elohim, but the doers of the law shall be declared right. For when the Gentiles who do not have the Torah by nature do what is in the Torah, although not having the Torah, they are a Torah to themselves, who show the work of the Torah written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or even excusing them 
in the day when Elohim shall judge the secrets of men through Yahusha Messiah according to my good news, or Paul says, my gospel. Then he preaches faith for salvation uh, in these verses. For we reckon that a man is declared right by belief without works of Torah. Or is he the Elohim of the, uh, the, Elohim of the Yehudim only and not also of the Gentiles? Yea, of the Gentiles also, since it is one Elohim who shall declare right the circumcised by belief and the uncircumcised through belief. Do we then nullify the Torah through the belief? Let it not be. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. So obviously here, faith and works work together. Uh, you have to have faith uh, without works, but then you have to have faith with your works. Uh, then back to law keeping again. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the matters of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the matters of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind of the flesh is enmity towards Elohim, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim, neither indeed is it able. And those who are in the flesh are unable to please Elohim. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of Elohim dwells in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Messiah, this one is not his." Let's go ahead and hit this next one. So then, brothers, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of Elohim, these are sons of Elohim. This is a, uh, an opportunity to point out that uh, many of the things that I have taught over the last 50 years have been, uh, well, 48 years, I guess, altogether, uh, are actually not true. Uh, there are things among the teachings that I have done that with the understanding of the difference of the kingdom gospel and the gospel of grace were uh, mistaken in establishing things that were written to the kingdom recipients uh, that I have, have applied in the uh, message to the body of Christ. Uh, here's an example. Uh, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. Well, uh, I reiterated teaching uh, previously taught that this is uh, one of the seven deaths of the Scripture, uh, though when you understand that this is written about kingdom, uh, gospel, then this really is death that is death. That is death separation from God. Not, not uh, operational death or relational death, but, but truly uh, the death of judgment. There's a bunch of those kind of things out there that I have mistaken, and that's part of what we're going to clear up when we get to the search for the spiritual life of the body of Christ. Uh, he then reveals that a remnant of Israel will be saved at the second coming, the times of refreshing, referred to by Peter at Pentecost and the prophets of old. Uh, and this is uh, Paul writing here in Romans. And Yeshua cries out on behalf of Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant shall be saved. For he is bringing a matter to an end and is cutting it short in righteousness because Yahuwah uh, shall cut short a matter on the earth. That's, again, a reference to the tribulation period and the uh, final judgment. Another faith reference that sounds like Christian but is written about kingdom belief. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of belief which we are proclaiming, that you confess with your mouth the Master Yahusha and believe, excuse me, believe in your heart that Elohim has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. Sounds Christian, but that's part of the doctrine also of the kingdom that uh, Christ was declared to be the Son of God 
Son of God, remember from our previous studies, was the term that God used for the king of Israel, specifically uh, starting with David, and uh, applies to Christ as well as the son of David who will sit on the throne. He was declared to be that son of God uh, by the resurrection, and that's why it became an important part of the uh, kingdom gospel presented in the book of Acts. And, of course, we believe it as well, but uh, this was written to the Jews and the believing Greeks of the synagogue that uh, they must believe this in order to be saved. Uh, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. Because the scripture says, whoever puts his trust in him will not be put to shame. Because there is no distinction between Heudite and Greek. For the same master of all is rich to all those calling upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he addresses the Greeks to explain their kingdom salvation. Read this carefully. Now if the first fruit is set apart, the lump is also. So he's talking about here uh, the leaven that is used for making bread, and uh, the first fruit is the starter for that leaven, and then the lump is what it grows into. So he's telling them, you are the lump. You are the lump that has grown from the starter of the leaven. That is the Jewish believers, the remnant of Israel, and uh, so you are set apart also And that's, of course, written to the Greeks. The Greeks here, that's another term that refers to uh, what we would call uh, righteous Gentiles or God-fearers, those who associated themselves with the synagogue in order to worship the, uh, (coughs) the God of Israel, Yahuwah. And uh, so uh, they are being addressed here. And if the root is set apart, so are the branches. Another allusion to the Israel being the root and the believing Greeks, the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree have been grafted in among them and came to share the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. And if you boast, remember, you do not bear the root, but the root bears you. You shall say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. See, this is the problem of the the conflict that was taking place in Romans, in the synagogues in Rome, that because of the dying out of the gospel of the kingdom message and the fact that it was the kingdom was not coming, then the Gentile believers, the Greeks, were becoming uh, judgmental of the Jews and were uh, treating them poorly. So this is, uh, in this section, Paul trying to straighten them out. You shall say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Good. By unbelief they were broken off. And you stand by belief. Do not be, igno- uh, do not be arrogant, but fear. For if Elohim did not spare the natural branches... He might not spare you either. Doesn't sound like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 either, does it? See then the kindness and sharpness of Elohim. On those who fell, sharpness. But toward you, kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also shall be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For Elohim is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not wish you to be ignorant of the secret, brothers, lest you should be wise in your own estimation, that hardening in part has come over Yisrael until the completeness of the Gentiles has come in. Um, this is uh, one of the seven mysteries in the book of Romans, none of which are our mystery 
gospel that we are uh, in the process of looking at and we'll look at more when we get to the body of Christ section of our study. Uh, the hardening in part has come over Israel. The hardening has come over. Why? Well, he tells us right at the beginning, your unrepentant hearts, your unrepentant hearts. All through the book of Acts, we saw Paul telling them, since you do not count yourself worthy of eternal life, I will take it to the Gentiles. So this is another uh, part of the uh, understanding of hermeneutics here, isagogics, that this is all about Israel and the grafted in Gentiles into Israel. Now there are a lot of people who teach that that's us, that we are grafted into the olive tree of Israel and become part of that. However, you must note here that uh, you, if you, if this is us, you can lose your salvation. You can, lo you can lose it. And obviously the Jews who had lost it could regain it because this was a matter of works and faith. Uh, and so all Israel will be saved as it has been written. The deliverer shall come out of Zion. He shall turn away wickedness from Jacob or Jacob or Israel. And this is my covenant with them. Remember, the Jews have covenants. What did uh, Ephesians chapter 2 tell us? You were strangers from the Messiah, strangers from the citizenship of Israel. This is what it was talking about here. These Greeks are becoming part of the citizenship of Israel as foreigners grafted in and uh, you were uh, aliens from the covenants. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Truly, as regards the good news, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of Elohim are not to be repented of. God does not change his mind. He established his unconditional covenants with Israel and he will perform them. For as you also at one time disobeyed Elohim, but now have obtained compassion through their disobedience, so also these have now disobeyed, that through the compassion shown you, they also might obtain compassion. For Elohim has shut them all up to disobedience in order to have compassion on all. Gentiles in the future kingdom. And again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise Yahuwah, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you peoples. And again, Yeshua says, There shall be a root of Jesse. That's Yeshai. And he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, on him the Gentiles shall set their expectation. And the Elohim of expectation fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you overflow with expectation by the power of the set-apart spirit. Now I myself am persuaded concerning you, my brothers, that you too are filled with goodness, complete in all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Tell me all this uh, complete in all knowledge that they have. What knowledge do they have at the time of this writing? They have the Tanakh. That is read every Sabbath day in the synagogues that they were attending. That's the knowledge base of this time. That's a, another uh, part of the critical error that we have is that there is, as we look back, we look back at these writings, the Gospels, Acts, all of the letters, we look back with the knowledge that we have now. If you were to eliminate Everything written after the book of Romans, that would be your knowledge base. And in fact, probably even uh, because the book of Acts was not yet written, uh, the, uh, the book of Acts came uh, later, uh, hardly anything was written down except probably Matthew's gospel was probably about the only thing that we have from the era 
of the writings of uh, Messiah, sorry, the Gospels, the only thing that they had. So again, we have to look back and understand the knowledge base that they had in order to help us with our interpretation of the scriptures. Uh, a major block in the wall of confusion of Christendom has been the failure to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Romans has been a major source of that confusion. As I said earlier, in Romans, Paul addresses unbelieving Jews, believing Jews, believing Gentiles, and believing Jews and Gentiles together. So if the Gentiles to whom Paul addresses his statements are the body of Christ, us, then surely we must persist in our belief or lose our salvation, as he says. This is another point of confusion in Christendom. And I've heard this uh, numerous times. You are saved as long as you do not stop believing. As long as you maintain your faith, you're saved. I had a discussion eh, not too long ago with, with a fellow that uh, he was talking about some uh, person who was in uh, the body of Christ uh, but had some sort of a life event and lost his faith and no longer believed in Christ. And I said, well, once he had believed, he was saved and he could not become unsaved. And this fellow said, oh, no, uh, no, you have to continue believing. You have to continue your faith or you're lost. And uh, that comes from the book of Romans that we just saw. But the message of the mystery gospel epistles is quite different. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithful, he remains faithful. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, since he cannot deny himself. Where is he in us? Could he deny himself? Uh, could he deny us if, uh, without denying himself? No. We remain saved because we are sealed when we believe. Also in Ephesians, another one of those mystery gospel books, in whom you also, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, <laughs> I have a backwards uh, word there, um, word order, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What are the three steps here? This is... This is uh, not why you're saved, but how you're saved. Okay? You heard the word of truth. Uh, you believed the word of truth, and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, what's a seal? What's a seal? A, a seal is a, well, at the time this was written, it was written, uh, it was uh, Wax was placed on the uh, scroll, and then the signet uh, sign, the, the emblem of the ruler, of the king, would place his stamp on that wax and make the impression of his uh, signet, his, his identif identifying uh, seal, mark. And so uh, that seal could only be broken by the one whose identification was contained in that signet or anyone that he authorized. Well, uh, of course, we know that uh, since God says that you cannot lose your salvation, that that sealing will never be broken, will never be broken. So that's the process. You hear, you believe the message, and then you are sealed. That settles it. Okay? Ephesians 4.30, Paul talks about it again. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How long does that seal last? Till the day of redemption. It's, it's not going to end uh, any time before then. So we in the body of Christ, through the mystery gospel, 
cannot sin our way out, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, or unbelieve our way out, 2 Timothy 2, 13, our salvation is rock solid, unlike the kingdom believer Gentiles. So let us now look at the synagogue information we didn't get to last week before time ran out to help us understand the isagogics of Paul's day. We'll begin to clear up the confusion with an article from a self-described Jewish believer in Yahusha the Hamashiach, Mark Nanos. Mark Nanos has written several books. Some of them are quite academic, uh, quite scholarly. Uh, some of them are uh, more lay readership uh, designed. And uh, this is one that's uh, pretty much lay readership designed. But, uh, of course, it's full of footnotes and references to other things. So there is some academia uh, involved in this. Uh, here is how he starts. It is not the intention of the study to offer a comprehensive view of diaspora Jews or of the Jewish religion. The diaspora is the Jews who have been scattered that started with the persecution of Paul uh, in Acts chapter uh, uh, 5, 6, 7 in that time frame when Paul was going about to kill the uh, believers in the Messiah, the kingdom believers. Then Paul became a kingdom believer and stopped that. But uh, that's the diaspora. Of course, it got uh, bigger and bigger with the uh, Jewish-Roman War that started in 66 A.D., about the time of Paul's death. Uh, really became huge uh, with the fulfillment of uh, Yahusha's uh, uh, warning that when you see the uh, city of Jerusalem compassed about by the enemy, uh, flee to the mountains and get out of there. Uh, they did. They ran and hid uh, throughout the land, throughout Asia predominantly. And uh, that's the diaspora, okay, the, the, the uh, dispersion of the Jews uh, or of the Jewish religion in Rome or elsewhere. However, it is necessary to discuss some of the issues in Jewish faith and practice that would have been operative in Rome at the time of Paul's letter. We must briefly consider several general issues that would have necessarily affected the interpretation of the language of Romans for, uh, for the original recipients. And that's, that's a key a statement there that we should all pay close attention to. The isagogics determine exegetics. And exegetics should help determine isagogics. So if I have viewpoint A from historical understanding so those are the writings and you can have among many you can have uh, at least two viewpoints viewpoint A is marked with the falsity of those church fathers that I talked about uh, from the second century on through uh, the writings of the you know, first translations of the Bible. That uh, the falsities included in there, of course, predominantly were anti-Semitism. And, of course, a great many of them were part of the uh, political Catholic uh, government uh, that ruled the churches for hundreds of years. And so there's a lot of false information in this viewpoint as they look at the scriptures. 
if you continually look at the scriptures with that false viewpoint, you get an interpretation of the language to fit that false viewpoint. You get that, uh, well, you get what I've been telling you uh, all along, that, that the uh, understanding of these books of the Bible, the Gospels, the book of Acts, and several other books, the writings of the 12 apostles uh, and James and Jude, uh, well, Jude was, uh, they have, when we look at those, we try to make them fit this false narrative in order to interpret them or even translate them. Obviously, the word church. Uh, the word church uh, did not exist at the time that any of the scriptures were written. Uh, and in fact, it's an old uh, English word uh, that meant a congregation. Uh, but to then, to make everything in the scriptures, the word church, uh, when it was an assembly of Jewish believers, uh, an assembly of Jewish believers a lot of times was synagogue. That was in those places, in those writings, uh, some 65 times. And so that gives us the wrong concept of what was being said here. So our objective is to utilize hermeneutics with uh, isagogics, categories, and exegetics without a bias, without a bias. And, and we're fortunate within the last 50 years there have been more and more understanding of these uh, uh, customs, practices, traditions, and interpretations of the book of Acts and the book of uh, the Gospels. And so we're better able to understand them now. So. Here are his examples. Number one, the role of the synagogue in the Jewish community and the parameters of its legal authority in relation to the Jewish community, the state, and Gentiles. Okay? So there are three groups. Uh, it, the synagogue had legal authority in relationship to the Jewish community, also in relationship to the Roman government, and also to the Gentiles who were God-fearers and... and uh, uh, righteous Gentiles that attended. Number two, God-fearing Gentiles and the Halakha operative in defining their righteousness. The Jews had a standard of righteousness for those Gentiles, and that standard of righteousness was not just made up on the spot. It actually came from the Torah. It actually came from the Old Testament writings that God had set forth as we, that we know as the law. Number three, attitudes toward and relations with Gentiles, particularly in matters of table fellowship, that relates to halakha, and synagogue attendance. Eschatological expectations is number four, particularly as they relate to the fate of the nations, uh, Gentiles, and the role of the children of Jacob dispersed among them, and finally, number five, the prevailing attitudes of Gentiles in Rome toward Jews and Judaism. Those are all factors that enter into the isagogics of interpreting the book of Romans. We must also discuss the probable makeup of the congregations receiving this letter, and most importantly, the probable audience Paul was concerned to affect with this message. That is, we must seek to understand both who was present in Rome and whom Paul targeted, his implied audience, as he composed this letter. Matters which have a great deal to do with interpreting his intentions and his message. Let's start with synagogue. The synagogue in the diaspora. The synagogue was the social institution gathering around which Jewish community life revolved in the diaspora regardless of the fact that there were many different views, factions, and sects 
that characterized and were generally accepted within first century Judaisms. While sometimes denoting a place of assembly, like Luke 7, 5, in the diaspora, often a home or a renovation of an existing structure, not the formal building structures of later times. The synagogue reached beyond the walls of any particular location in defining the organization of the Jewish communities. In the period we are concerned with, the synagogues were institutions defining the Jewish communities as religious and legal entities in the Roman Empire. The Roman government legally classified them as collegia, a term used with respect to their shared traits with private clubs, guilds, and other cultic associations that were legally recognized to have the same privileges. Those privileges, the right to assemble, to have common meals, common property, fiscal responsibilities, a treasury, disciplinary rights among its membership, and responsibility for the burial of members. Those were the collegia, and the Jewish synagogues were granted collegia status. In addition to those privileges usually granted private clubs, Julius Caesar granted the Jewish communities the privilege, quote, to live according to their ancestral laws, close quote, because of their existence before the Roman Empire and because of their help in the Civil War in the Maccabean period. These legal privileges were discussed at length by Josephus and included the authority to interpret the law and customs for the community. <coughs> Pardon me. Exemption from emperor worship and civic cults. The right to collect and distribute the temple tax for Jerusalem. Okay? Those were the legal privileges. They uh, had these privileges granted by Julius Caesar and they were continued on by other, uh, other uh, Caesars after that. Exemption from military service is another one. Protection of Sabbath observance, including non-appearance in court. The uh, courts went on uh, on Sabbath day in Rome, but the Jews were excluded from uh, appearing in court on the Sabbath uh, in honor of their historical, uh, the, histor the history of Judaism pre-existing Rome. That was part of the reason that they were granted these uh, special dispensations. Uh, and the right to function as independent organizations without specifically seeking authorization to do so. In other words, uh, they had freedom within the basic limitations. The synagogue governed the Jewish community in religious, moral, legal, administrative, educational, and virtually every other aspect of social interaction necessary in the life of a community. Essentially, the synagogue represented the uh, independence of the community in the midst of foreign cultures in foreign lands as a place of refuge and boundary for the worship of God and practice of righteousness as defined by the law and interpreted by the leaders of the communities. Uh, Laplana summed up the synagogue community's self-governing situation in Rome thusly. It possessed, in fact, an administrative, educational, and juridical organization of its own, and it exercised both directly and through the central organ of community government not only a religious and moral authority over its members, but also a form of civil jurisdiction in regulating contracts and settling disputes, and even a limited criminal jurisdiction with the power to inflict penalties, which were sanctioned by the public authorities. In a word, the Jewish associations, taken all together, actually possessed all the essential elements of organization and government pertaining to a city, and not merely showed the semblance of such institutions, as with the, was the case with collegia. So the Jews had greater freedom and greater uh, privileges and rights than the other collegia, the other private clubs. Uh, let's... Uh, Go ahead and go back one slide here. Uh, this a form of 
civil jurisdiction rega regulating contract settling disputes, and even a limited criminal jurisdiction with the power to inflict penalties, which were sanctioned by the public authority. Remember how many times Paul was beaten uh, when he went to the synagogues? That's what this relates to. Prior to 70 CE, it appears that the synagogues usually held their meetings on the Sabbath and other holidays for worship. This community worship, which was understood primarily as the study of Torah and prayer, when at least 10 adult males gathered to do so, was the centerpiece of Jewish religious life. The community would gather for the reading of the scriptures as well as their translation, interpretation, and commentary or exhortation. That's, for example, after the Torah reading uh, we read in Acts that uh, they said it, to Paul and, and Barnabas, uh, do you have any word of encouragement for us? To other people were allowed to speak after the reading of the, uh, of the scriptures. That's the exhortation. Prayers would have included blessings such as the Shema, the Kadash, the Kiddush, and the, and the Havdalah. They also gathered regularly in the synagogue or in their homes, particularly if they could not afford a separate building or a house of assembly, for festivals, meals, education, and community business. The responsibility of synagogue leaders included both religious and practical matters of administration. Although each synagogue in Rome was autonomous, they operated under the same structure and associated with the others. The leadership included several positions. The synagogue ruler over religious activities, a council for general affairs, an archon for non-religious affairs, a secretary, and an official for financial responsibilities. Uh, and I, uh, I, I left out the Jewish names for each, or the Greek uh, names for each of these offices so as to not clutter it up too much. But uh, the archon and uh, the... Uh, for non-religious affairs and the uh, synagogue ruler, they're the ones who threw Paul out quite often. Okay? They would have handled the many financial and ethical issues necessary in the community affairs. For example, they were responsible to ensure correct behavior among the members, including judgment and discipline. Paul bears witness to this in his early persecution of the way in Damascus, synagogues and in the various floggings and stonings he later underwent for the same reasons at the hands of the Jewish authorities. Remember Paul took his letters from from Jerusalem and went to the synagogues uh, uh, and there beat any of the believers who were in attendance and even had them killed. Right? That's the synagogues. That's why he went to the synagogues before he became a believer in Yahusha he went to the synagogues to find, search out believers of the way. That's what it was called. Uh, the way was uh, a, a, a reference to Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So followers of Jesus were identified as being part of the way, and he went to the synagogues to search them out, beat them, and to have them killed. Uh, that's part of that synagogue authority. Uh, you'll see uh, next hour as we go through this in greater detail uh, and see more of the workings of the synagogue that, well, here it is right here, the next paragraph. <laughs> One did not simply pass in and out of membership in the synagogue community at will. If one was a member of the community, one was subordinate to the synagogue leader's authority and discipline. If one refused to do so, one was no longer regarded as a member of the community. That then did what to you? You no longer had those legal rights that were granted to the Jews. You now had to partake of cultic worship, uh, emperor worship. You had to serve in the military. You had to eat what they fed you in the military, which was a big issue. Uh, and you had to uh, uh, follow all of the rules of the Romans. So to leave, to be thrown out of the community or to willingly leave it 
you were giving up your life. You were, you were as good as dead uh, if you w- would leave. So the community had a very, very strong hold on its members. Okay, well, let's take a break and come back at quarter after the hour, and we'll pick this up and learn more about the synagogue as we uh, conclude this part of our study. Father, we're grateful for this hour. We ask that you, uh, through the spirit that resides within us, uh, increase our knowledge based on the teaching that we've had this hour. Thank you in Yahusha's name. Amen. Welcome back to the second hour of our study, and we're currently studying uh, as part of the hermeneutical structures uh, related to the interpretation of the book of Romans that we looked at last week. Uh, We are looking at specifically synagogues and their place in Jewish life and the things that were important and the things that give us insight into understanding passages in the scriptures that seemingly are confusing to us, uh, those passages that we kind of skip over uh, because we really don't understand what's going on, and uh, some of them will become meaningful in our understanding of the Gospels and the book of Acts uh, as we go through and look at the requirements of the kingdom, uh, gospel and so on, and the things that were going on at the time. So... Let's get back to it. Father, we're grateful for the second hour of our study. We ask again for the knowledge of your will as we study. In Yahusha's name, amen. All right. They would have handled the many financial and ethical issues necessary in the community affairs. For example, they were responsible to ensure correct behavior among the members, including judgment and discipline. Paul uh, bears witness to this in his early persecution of the way in the Damascus synagogues and in the various floggings and stonings he later underwent in the same synagogues for the same reasons at the hands of the Jewish authorities. One did not simply pass in and out of membership in the synagogue community at will, If one was a member of the community, one was subordinate to the synagogue leaders, authority, and discipline. If one refused to do so, one was no longer regarded as a member of the community. I brought out, at the uh, this was the last slide from last hour, uh, brought out about Paul's uh, beatings and and the importance of the synagogue in the life of the believers. Uh, The man who had never uh, spoken, since birth, or was the one that was he blind from birth, that Jesus healed. And he was in his, like, 40 years old. And the uh, Pharisees brought him before for testimony, and they even brought in his parents. And it says, for fear of the synagogue leaders, they did not want to testify. Because what what the man said was true. Uh, He was healed by Yahusha. Uh, but they knew that if they did, these leaders would ostracize them, kick them out of the synagogues, and their lives would be uh, severely hampered, and they would be ostracized by all of the Jews in their community. So that's another, that's one that we'll see coming up when we get to that point. The leaders also answered to the Roman authorities for the collection and distribution of taxes. See, you just can't get away from taxes. You can have all of the dispensations that the Roman government can give you about, re- about military service, about uh, uh, running your own community, all of those things, but you still have to pay the tax. In this sense, they served as representatives of the government for the Jewish community. Guess what they called the people who worked for the synagogues who had to do this? Tax collectors. Uh, One in particular, Matthew, a tax collector. Additional activities under their jurisdiction included schooling of children, providing lodging for travelers, and the burial of members. There were several, 11 or perhaps many more, synagogues in Rome in 55 to 58 uh, AD when Romans was written. 
It is likely that each operated independently as they were characterized by the cultural makeup of the various, various Jewish communities that settled in Rome for different reasons, from slavery to commercial opportunity, and they had also come from a variety of locations throughout the Roman Empire. So each synagogue had its own uh, individual makeup, uh, and people would join that synagogue based on what they were there for. Were they there for commerce? Were they there uh, as freed slaves? Were they there uh, for some other uh, economic or uh, other purpose? The, each of them were different, uh, but they were all under the same authority of structure. The largest concentration of Jews was in the area called the uh, trans, trans <laughs> I always have trouble with this word, uh, trans um trans I think it's berinium actually, but yeah, now known as uh, Trastevere in Rome. Much easier. I can pronounce that one. Where many Oriental groups settled, but additional communities were in uh, Sabura, uh, near the Campus Martius, and near the Porta Capina areas of Rome. All right, let's look at righteous Gentiles, the Noahide commandments, and the apostolic decree. This follows under the heading of our introduction there of uh, how the Jews saw the Gentiles. Uh, later we'll see how the Gentiles saw the Jews. But this time we'll look at the righteous Gentiles, the Noahide uh, commandments, and the apostolic decree. Understanding the prevailing concept of righteous Gentiles or God-fearers at the time of Paul's letter is important to understanding Judaism's views on righteousness for the non-Jew both inside and outside the boundaries of Judaism. While rabbinic writings indicate that the salvation of Gentiles without circumcision was a topic of concern for rabbinic Judaism in the centuries following the sharp break between the church and the synagogue, it was cast in more philosophical and eschatological terms. Okay? Rabbinic writings indicate the salvation of Gentiles without circumcision as Gentiles rather than Jews. How would Gentiles be saved? How could they be considered righteous? Well, uh, if they were not part of the uh, citizenship of Israel, not uh, subject to the covenants, uh, how could they be saved? And uh, they were open to it. It was not, uh, Jews did not, summarily exclude all Gentiles. Let me put it that way. There were, there were, there were ways, because it was in the law, that you could, you could uh, associate with the Jews. There was no longer a major movement of Gentiles seeking to attach themselves to the Jewish community and their worship of Israel's God. Uh, the question turned to the status of righteous Gentiles with respect to their standing before God in the world to come, which was usually positive at times even regarding Christians as Noahides. All right, well, here's where I uh, started to correct but failed to see this one. And Mark Nanos, being a Ph.D., being a Jew, being a highly educated Jew, still did not understand that the early believing Gentiles in the book of Acts were not Christians. They were God-fearers. They were Messianics or Messianites are the terms used to describe them. So do not be confused by Mark Nanos uh, thinking that the early believers were the same as Christians today, but Noahides. They were Noahides. They were uh, righteous Gentiles. They were God-fearers. There is nevertheless general agreement that the behavior and destiny of righteous Gentiles or God-fearers 
in the context of their association with the Jewish community, was of considerable concern in the period we are examining, even though the exact details of these labels are debatable. We see them, we know that that's, they were the labels, but we don't know everything about them. While these Gentiles did not keep Jewish law per se, the 613 commandments of Torah, they kept what was later referred to in Rabbinic Judaism as the Noahide or Noachian commandments. These Noahide commandments trace their roots to biblical antecedents, particularly to the Mosaic model for the laws governing the resident alien living in Palestine, the stranger within your gates, as found in Leviticus and Exodus. In other words, the, the Levitical laws provided the historic halakha for governing the minimal requirements of purity and righteousness for foreigners dwelling in the land of Israel. These rules of behavior evolved during Diaspora Judaism into the seven central religious and ethical principles for the sons of Noah, that is, for describing the behavior of Gentiles who were righteous without becoming Jews, and for those Gentiles who were in the process of conversion to Judaism. So now we know who Cornelius was, right? Cornelius was not just some uh, pagan Gentile. He was a God-fearer, as he's identified in the, in the uh, book of Acts, in chapter 10. But, uh, 9, yeah, 10. And he, uh, he was a synagogue attendee, he and his family attended synagogue. So he was borderline okay. <laughs> um, the righteous Gentiles need not take upon themselves the 613 commandments of Torah that applied to Jews in their worship of the one God, but they must obey at least these seven. All right? These commandments were linked to the covenant with Noah along with the rainbow in that they described just and proper behavior for the fathers of Israel, not only Abraham but all his descendants, until Moses received the law at Sinai. And they became the prevailing criteria for defining the operative features of the faith and practice that would be expected to characterize all the righteous Gentiles standing outside the covenant with Israel thereafter. So now we know where that came from, right? These commandments were linked to the covenant with Noah along with the rainbow, Genesis 9, and that they described just and uh, proper behavior for the fathers of Israel. Uh, so started with Noah, but they continued down through Abraham. So Gentiles without the law, uh, started long before the law. <laughs> started at the time of Noah. The particulars of both the Mosaic model and the Noahide model for defining the behavior incumbent upon righteous Gentiles are similar to those outlined by Luke in describing the Jerusalem Council's apostolic decree in Acts 15, and 16, and 21, it's also reported. In general, these commandments were concerned with monotheistic issues asserted in the rejection of idolatry with its concomitant sexual and dietary characteristics. So what were these rules about? Idolatry, and what went with the celebration of idolatry, all pagan cults were sexual drunkards, okay? Bacchus, you know about Bacchus and Rome, the, the uh, horrible uh, celebrations that they had uh, of overindulgence and, and uh, uh, sexual activity, all of that. Well, that was part of all pagan religions. They went for that stuff. Okay. All right. Um, the Noahide commands uh, provided the standards that Gentiles without the law of Moses would be expected to maintain if they truly honored the one God. 
we have in the apostolic decree perhaps the best indication available of where the fluid process of the development and application of the notion of the Noahide commandments were among Jews concerned with Gentile question in the middle of the first century CE. The ancient mosaic model for laws incumbent upon the stranger within your gates, that is for the non-Jews living in the land of Israel, included abstaining from, one, sacrifices to idols, eating blood in Leviticus, incest, work on the Sabbath, eating unleavened bread during Passover. Those were the seven, I mean the five rules, later made they made them into seven, but that was after the biblical era. Well, it's eating leavened bread during the Passover. Sorry. The four commandments of the apostolic decree drew from both these models to address the particular needs of this new Jewish movement in the, in the middle of the first century CE and included, number one, things sacrificed to idols, number two, blood, number three, things strangled, number four, fornication. Now some of the others, some of the other more ethical concerns did not need to be addressed because they were covered elsewhere in defining the lifestyle incumbent upon followers of Jesus Christ. However, the purity issues needed to be addressed in order for the Gentiles to meet the minimal requirements of holiness in the Jewish communities to which they were becoming attached through their new faith in the King of the Jews. So that was, essentially, this is how you do not offend the members of the synagogue uh, and their God, essentially, is what these were about. Thus we, have, uh, we thus have in the apostolic decree a snapshot of a stage in the historical development from laws that had been originally addressed to Gentile sojourners in the land of Israel, the Mosaic model, to laws that were later developed to address the situations of the diaspora where Jews were the ones sojourning among Gentiles and living under their laws, the Noahide commandment model. The Christian, what's that word? Uh, yeah, the Messianics. Is that Messianic? Did that work out right? Okay. The Messianics. These are those still in Israel, still meeting in the synagogue, still hanging with the Jews. Okay. These are not what we would call Christians uh, because we call Christians the body of Christ to differentiate between uh, the uh, Messianic kingdom believers and us today. The Messianic model for purity laws, the apostolic decree, thus addressed the dual tensions of a Jewish diaspora community dwelling among Gentiles and seeking to include them in their community as equals and the requirements of holiness that would necessarily apply to those Gentiles who chose to become a part of this Jewish community. The general contours of these halakhot for the righteous Gentiles certainly extended beyond the strict definition of these particulars to the many characteristics of behavior that would be expected to accompany worship of the one God at any given time by Gentiles wishing to associate with the practice of Judaism in their worship of her God. And you see them in the book of Romans uh, and in the writings of the original 12 apostles, uh, Peter, James, John, and Jude. And of course, James was not an apostle. He was the brother of the Lord, uh, but became a leader in the, in the church of Jerusalem, the ecclesia of Jerusalem. This was noted earlier in the statement of James at the Jerusalem Council to explain the underlying intentions of the apostolic decree. It is important to recognize that righteous Gentiles were welcomed by the synagogue in the first century and practiced specific Jewish customs, 
but without a standing as full-fledged Jews since they were not circumcised. They were regarded as potential Jews, perhaps at various stages in the conversion process. The rabbis later found this semi-convert status less appealing with the rise of Christianity. Now, there, that's the right word there. With the rise of Christianity in the, in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries, with the rise of Christianity and modified their Jews of the Noahide commandments, however, Judaism has always been aware of and concerned with the fate of the, non, of the righteous non-Jew. Whether or not the early Christians were culled largely from these God-fearers, as is often suggested, the concept of righteous Gentiles was operative and the t- at the time and helps explain both positive and negative Jewish responses to early Christian Gentiles' claims of equal co-participation in the blessings of God. I really should have gone through and uh, done more of this, but Christian, Christian, okay. Um, Is there another one in there? Okay. Those were... Give you another word that uh, is used to describe them. Messianites. And the believers were first called Messianites in, where was that? uh, Philippi? Where was that? Uh, Suddenly left me. Um, These, during the book of Acts, there were no what we would call Christians. They were Messianic, uh, righteous Gentiles. (coughs) Pardon me. Gentiles who believed in the Messiah. And I believe became part of the remnant, even though uh, they're not specifically stated to be so. Um, I believe that they would uh, qualify as part of the remnant. Responses would have sometimes been positive because Gentiles behaving righteously in worship of the one God were welcomed in the synagogue, whether to worship and learn the scriptures or for other reasons. Marriage, uh, uh, dating, uh, whatever reason that they they would attend uh, uh, or become part of the community. However, it also helps explain the possible rejection of Messianic Gentiles who may have sought association with the synagogue if they resisted the practice of the minimal requirements of righteousness and purity that were incumbent upon Gentiles wishing to count themselves among the people of God, they would have been criticized and unwelcome. That again, part of the Roman uh, conflict that was going on uh, in the uh, synagogues in Rome and why Paul would speak to one group and then the other and and he called them all brothers, uh, to, and he said uh, to be one, that you want, he wanted them to become one in spirit, uh, all of those things, because they were not. They were uh, arguing about it. Uh, remember these, these uh, new Messianites. Uh, let's see if I can go ahead and help with that. So in the congregation of the synagogue, referred to oftentimes as the assembly, it's not the direct translation of the word synagogue, but is a synonym. And uh, in there were, of course, Jews. There were uh, God-fearers. Also known as 
righteous. Gentiles. Righteous Gentile God-fearers were predominantly Hellenistas, Greeks. All, probably almost exclusively, uh, they were Hellenistas. They were Greeks, and that's why Paul addresses the book of Romans to the Jews and the Greeks, right? Because they were uh, this group of people. So now then, in fact, let me just go ahead and use it. But now, when Paul started going to the pagans, the Thessalonians, the Corinthians, all of the Gentiles who were not God-fearers, not righteous Gentiles, and giving them the gospel of the kingdom, and they started believing in Messiah, where were they going to go? To the synagogues. Right? And so they didn't know all of this stuff from beforehand. The God-fearers and righteous Gentiles knew all about the Noahide uh, commandments. Uh, but these new Gentiles, the pagan Gentiles, as opposed to the Greek Gentiles who were God-fearers and righteous Gentiles. Now you had pagans. What? What? What was their practice? Idolatry, sex, drunkenness, blood... Drinking blood, eating animal sacrifice to idols, right? That was what they did. That was their normal life in their, uh, in their communities. And they didn't know anything about the Noahide commands. So Paul's out there. Uh, this is the, the background of Acts 15, uh, the Jerusalem Council. Paul's out there bringing these pagans into uh, the synagogues and not acceptable. And so, of course, the religious Jews, uh, typified by the Pharisees, said, uh, well, they've got to become Jews. Well, they, they must follow the rules and become Jews. Uh, just like these God-fearers, see, God-fearers, were considered to be those who were in the process of becoming Jews. Even though they may never do it, they were still considered to be that by the religion people. Uh, and uh, so Paul's teaching them, oh no, you don't have to follow the law. Well, that caused a big uproar. Of course, the uh, Judaizers went to them, like Galatia, and said, oh yeah, 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 that faith thing, and this Hopefully now you're going to see how this fits. That faith thing in Messiah is only step one. The step two is keeping the law. Keeping the law. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Believe in Messiah, keep his law. Okay? So... They had to have a meeting. I mean, they were following Paul around and telling them, you got to you gotta uh, become Jews. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law. You've got to do all of that in order to really be messianics. Right? And uh, Paul said, no, you don't. So he had no small dispute with them, it says in Galatians. Uh, no small dispute with them. And uh, so they went to Jerusalem with a group uh, from that congregation and said, uh, no, this isn't right. And so uh, he presented what had happened. Now, what was his chief argument uh, that they were really believers? Tongues. Tongues. They spoke in tongues because that was a sign of the kingdom, was that 
with people by by uh, with people who speak with other languages I will provoke you to jealousy uh, says the Lord in the Old Testament that the Gentiles would speak uh, in tongues uh, for the Jews so it was a it was a miraculous sign that these pagans would speak in uh, in unknown tongues okay uh, Peter said, you know, God sent me, chose me, you know, the way Peter talked. Uh, you know, all, uh, everybody, that God chose me to go to the Gentiles first. Of course, what did Peter do when he went to the Gentiles? You know, it's unlawful for me to be here with you Gentiles. Okay? How he refused uh, be, when he was first told to. He said, oh, no, Lord, I'd never touch anything unclean. You know me. And... Uh, so, uh, but after he had gone and after uh, he saw that it was okay, that it worked out, then he was proud of the fact that he was the first one to go to the God-fearers and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to them. So he brought that up, uh, and then James said, uh, this is what was written in the prophets. Uh, after these days, I will return and rebuild the temple and establish, essentially establish the kingdom. And of course they understood that in the kingdom the Gentiles would be, could be saved because that's all in the prophecies of the Old Testament Gentiles in the kingdom. Uh, so the, then they said, oh, okay. So these, even those pagans who are coming in, they're part of the kingdom also. So uh, uh, James says, so why would we want to put on them what we can't obey, the whole law, uh, let's just put on them the same restrictions that the law put on Gentiles living among the Jews throughout the Old Testament, the Noahide commands. And the Jews said, oh, okay. And what Paul and Barnabas say? Oh, okay. And they went and they taught the pagans in the book of Acts, these are your commandments that you must keep. Okay. Does that sound like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? No. It was not the gospel of the grace of God, the body of Christ. Table, oops, table fellowship, particularly in the context of Gentile participation, was a significant concern among diaspora Jews. The many laws and customs that made it necessary generally to separate from association in Gentile meals or from the eating of many Gentile foods, whether in the company of Gentiles or not, made table fe fellowship a notable issue. It was a huge issue. Remember Peter eating with the Gentiles and Paul had to uh, uh, grab him by the lapels and slam him up against the wall and, and uh, read him the riot act because Peter was eating with the Gentiles uh, table fellowship until the Jews from Jerusalem came down and then Peter withdrew from the Gentiles and uh, would only eat with the Jews. It was over Halakha, over this table fellowship issue. And Paul said, if you being a Jew do not live like a Jew eating with the Gentiles, why do you do this now? You are, you stand condemned. Okay? Now, think about that. You stand condemned. This is Peter. Peter, who, you know, of course, some people say, upon this rock I will build my church, all that, which is incorrect understanding of the scriptures. But Peter is the, Peter and, and James are the leaders of, of the messianic kingdom of the Jews. And Paul gets in his face and reads him the riot act. And not only that, he says, you stand, confu uh, you stand condemned. What happens when you're condemned in the kingdom? You're gone. You're gone. You're out of the kingdom. Right? Because you could not sin uh, and be a part of the kingdom. Uh, you had to confess that sin and make restitution and so on. Okay? So, uh, 
However, Jews did eat with Gentiles given proper circumstances. And in the context of righteous Gentiles attending synagogue, this matter became a regular necessity. Gentiles attending synagogue and participating in the lifestyle of the Jewish community or visiting Jewish homes were expected to adopt minimal Jewish practices. This behavior demonstrated respect not only for Jewish sensitivities, but in the mind of the Jews at least, it represented respect for the righteousness of God that would be expected to accompany the faith of the righteous Gentile, for God is holy. Thus, while considerate and polite behavior and deference to Jewish sensitivities would undoubtedly have been greatly appreciated, particularly from Gentiles who were simply pagan guests, the underlying expectations towards Gentiles claiming to fear the God of Israel was far greater. Right? So that was the issue. Who were these Romans uh, in these synagogues? Believing Jews, believing Gentiles, and non-believing Jews. Who would be uh, offended by these pagans not following the right table manner rules, table fellowship rules? the Jews and the believing Jews, the Messianic Jews, the Jews who believe in Messiah. It was expected that their behavior would demonstrate they had turned from idolatry to worship the one God, having put off their former deeds of darkness to adopt the lifestyles of those enlightened to see the holiness of God. It is in this context that the halakhic discussed above, represented in the various models of, of Mosaic law, Noahide commandments, and the apostolic decree were operative in shaping the expectations of the Jewish community toward the behavioral requirements of the God-fearing Gentile seeking association. Outside the synagogue, the issues were not so easily resolved, for Jews simply found association with idolatry almost unavoidable when among Gentiles, particularly in the context of sharing in their meals. But provisions were made. Jews simply refrained from meat and wine when questionable, ate vegetables and drank water, or brought their own food and wine. Remember, there's talk in there about, you know, uh, eating vegetables in the Book of Romans. Well, that's what that's about. This is, this is the issue here. Uh, uh, we will not eat the meat that could have been sacrificed to idols because a Gentile had it at their house. So that's part of that issue, okay? Uh, thus, while Jews saw themselves adapting a kind of accommodating posture involving some sacrifices to facilitate fellowship with Gentiles, particularly table fellowship, Gentiles generally saw things differently. The underlying separatism and notable judgment of their lifestyles often offended Gentiles, and as I review below, was cause for derision and accusations of misanthropy. Gentiles were welcome to attend synagogue, a house of prayer for all people, it says in Isaiah 56, and participate in the Jewish community without necessarily becoming proselytes. However, they were expected to adopt specific righteous behavior incumbent upon those claiming the right to worship among the congregation of Israel, certainly in deference to the Jewish people and their customs, but more importantly, to satisfy the minimal guidelines of righteousness and purity expected to accompany the behavior of Gentiles claiming the right to worship the Lord as uh, uh, the Lord of Israel as the Lord of the whole world. I hope you're seeing more and more of the context of Romans in light of this. Then we have the eschatological approach here. The expectations of the future. Eschatological views reflect the diversity characteristic of the entire spectrum of first century Judaism, which included many even strongly conflicting views among its members, particularly evident in their hopes for the future. Yet most, if not all, Jews of the mid-first century earnestly hoped for the promised restoration of Israel and the triumph of Israel's God as the one God of all the nations, which necessarily included a position on the destiny of the Gentiles, although it is difficult to speak of the views of the Jews of Rome specifically. We don't have any, any uh, 
fragments or anything that talk about it specifically in Rome. This hope involved a complex web of particularism and universalism. Israel's destiny was at the fore, yet the destiny of all the world, whether through conversion, subjugation, or final destruction, was equally in view. Do you see any, anything in there that may have shaped Muhammad's uh, view of Islam? Right? Through conversion, subjugation, or final destruction, was equally in view. It's uh, part of what he uh, inappropriately took from Judaism. Judaism uh, saw it as uh, a, a grace benefit uh, in the future uh, and subjugation by the Messiah, the king in the kingdom, not subjugation by them as individual Jews to be able to subjugate people or destroy them, okay? So it was a mis, uh, misinterpretation, a mis, more so a misapplication of what was understood in Judaism, and, and uh, Muhammad, uh, living among the Jews, would know about that and adapted it into uh, Islam. The, uh, let me go ahead and reread that. Israel's destiny was at the fore, yet the destiny of all the world, whether through conversion, subjugation, or final destruction, was equally in view, albeit through the agency of Israel and her God. Not through the individual, uh, like uh, Bohaban made it for the uh, radical Muslim. The book of Isaiah developed powerfully the notion of the positive universal expectation of the ingathering of the nations and their certain recognition of the one Lord of Israel as the one Lord of all the world and would follow from Israel, that would follow from Israel's restoration. What was the hope? Israel's restoration and the Jewish hope, I mean the uh, Gentile hope was through association with Israel that they too could be saved. All right, that was the whole idea. And now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, in order that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, it is too small a thing uh, uh, that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, that's the remnant. I will also make you a light of the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. You see, is that prophecy? Is that a mystery? If it's a prophecy, it can't be a mystery. If it was hid in God from before the foundation of the world and never, never revealed since the foundation of the world until Paul, there has to be a difference between these Gentiles and Gentiles like us. This view informed most expectation of first century Jews, seen clearly in the language of Paul and the writers of the New Testament, but equally evident in other literature of the period. After this, uh, they uh, all will return from their exile and will rebuild, rebuild Jerusalem in splendor, and in it uh, the temple of God will be rebuilt, just as the prophets of Israel have said concerning it, then the nations in the whole world will all be converted and worship God in truth. They will abandon all their idols, which deceitfully have led them into their error, and in righteousness they will praise the eternal God. You will find that people will misapply this passage, uh, well, this isn't a passage, but an explanation of the passages that uh, say this, that uh, when you say... Uh, I worry about a relative of mine who has never believed and they're approaching their death. Someone will say, don't worry about it. Everybody will be saved. Remember that? Okay. Uh, in the end, everybody will be saved, right? All right. Uh, that's a misapplication, but that's where that comes from. All the Israelites who are saved in those days and are truly mindful of God will be gathered together. Who will be? 
all the Israelites who are saved in those days and are truly mindful of God will be gathered together. How many Jews will die in the tribulation period? Two-thirds of the Jews will die because they're not believers in Messiah. Okay? So when it says all Israel will be saved, it's remember in Romans, Paul says, uh, all Israel isn't everybody in Israel. It's only the remnant. Only those who believe are the remnant. It's important to note uh, I guess I better do that. All the Israelites who are saved in those days and are truly mindful of God will be gathered together. They will go to Jerusalem and live in safety forever in the land of Abraham, and it will be given over to them. It is important to note that these hopes were not for the cessation of life in the created world and escape to some other spiritual one. And they certainly were not concerned primarily with personal salvation after death, as came to be the concern of Western individualism in later years. Jews had no heavenly hope. No. No heavenly hope. Their hope was in the reestablishment of Israel and living where? In the land. Where's the land? On earth. Okay? That's the expectation of the Jews. Uh, we'll see. Uh, he doesn't emphasize it, but he does bring it out, and so we'll see it. Uh, the, uh, the whole gospel uh, by, is misunderstood by us. Yes? Resurrection, yeah. Yeah, they'll all be in the, in the resurrection. That's the, that's the renovation and the, re, and the refreshing, times of refreshing that, that Peter talked about in second chapter of Acts. They no doubt had personal concerns for their afterlife, but their central hope was for the restoration of this world to its intended purpose under the lordship of the Creator. Even those concerns that included the individual affirm the restoration of this world in the age to come rather than escape from this world, uh, resurrection of the body rather than flight of the soul, renewal of the city of Jerusalem rather than pastoral bliss. It was all about Israel and the land. Israel's hope was a corporate hope of renewal, freedom, shalom, or peace among all the nations. In fact, among all the created order. It was rooted in the prophetic promises in spite of the present suffering under the yoke of foreign rule with its frequently oppressive policies. Israel's Lord would ultimately rescue them from foreign dom dominion, which rescue was often expected to occur when they're suffering for past breaches of covenant and the law, the covenant, law of covenant too, had completed its cleansing purpose. Uh, here's a few uh, references that you might want to look up and see this uh, uh, reason for the cleansing purposes of the Jews. This expectation included features such as a return to the land and usually the rebuilding of the temple. The dispersed children of Jacob would return to Zion where the one God would reign as king over all and all the nations would come to worship him there. More references to Gentiles in the kingdom. Okay? For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Isaiah 33. So, this then was what the gospel meant to Jews of the day and even today. Isaiah 52, 7 is the gospel. Huh. Isaiah 52, 7 is the good news. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, who announces salvation or deliverance, and says to Zion, your God reigns. Salvation to the Jew of the first century was belief in deliverance from the kingdoms of the world and restoration of their earthly kingdom uh, in the land. <coughs> now you'll reread the gospel of the kingdom in the gospels when it says, 
Repent, for the kingdom from heaven is at hand. What does that mean to them? Well, this Isaiah 52, 7 talked about uh, the mountaintop messengers that when Israel uh, was in battle with an enemy, they would station these uh, people uh, on tops of mountains and they had messages to send back to Jerusalem uh, by uh, smoke signals and that type of thing. And they would, just like they would, how they knew when the first star had arisen in the, in the east, when they knew when it happened for Passover. Uh, they would send a signal from the site of the battle. This is the battle. And these are mountaintops. Okay? And this is Jerusalem. Okay, so you had these, and they would send a writer to uh, give the word on how the battle was going. And this guy would send a message to this guy, who would send a message to this guy, who would send it to a courier, and they would take it to Jerusalem. And that's who they're talking about here, that the king has won the battle, the Jews have won their battle, and... Uh, Announcing the deliverance. The Jews are delivered. The Jews have won the war. They are free from dominion by the Gentiles, from the na by the nations. Okay? So that's what is talked about in Isaiah, and that's what they understood. Uh, who were they being dominated by at the time of Yahusha's uh, hypostatic union? Rome. Rome. How long had they been under uh, dominion? of other rulers for a long, long time. So when John the baptizer said, the uh, repent uh, and be baptized for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what were they thinking? They were going to be freed by the warrior Messiah. And so that's the, that was the gospel. It wasn't that you're going to go to heaven. That wasn't what the kingdom of heaven was about for them. Uh, they had no heavenly hope. They had a hope of deliverance in the land, to their land, freedom, and freedom from oppression. So that's another one of those huge mistakes that Christianity makes about the gospel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how lovely are the feet of him who brings, okay? Uh, now we think that that's the, uh, the, the, our gospel now. And it's true that way, but, but that's not what was talked about, not what was meant in Israel at the time of Messiah. Uh, here's the song of salvation for the Jew and the kingdom Gentile. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills. Chief of the mountains, kingdoms. The uh, hills, uh, governments and uh, uh, tribes and uh, other groups. And the peoples will stream to it. And many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. That's all caps, Lord. That's Yahuwah. Uh, the mountains of Yahuwah and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the gospel. No, the what? The law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. That's their future. Doesn't sound like playing a harp in heaven to me. It doesn't sound like a heavenly hope. Sounds like a righteous earth. Why did God create the earth anyway? For people to inhabit it. And he named a people that would. And then he gave grace to Gentiles to inhabit it with them. 
they will hammer their sword. You've heard this one. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. And each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken, though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God. As for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. That both biblical and non-biblical literature look for the kingship of uh, uh, Yahuwah over a restored and victorious Israel is clear, as is the fact that there were expectations of a human king or messiah However, the exact expectations with respect of this Messiah or to this Messiah are not clear. Okay, well, we didn't quite get through everything that I wanted to get through today, so I'm going to repurpose this next section uh, between now and next week and try to incorporate it into our study on the, the kingdom requirements of the Gospels and Acts so that we will get the information but we won't uh, spend uh, a half an hour specifically on it. Okay? All right, so hopefully your, uh, your perspectives have changed and you are seeing more and more as I prepare you to understand the Gospels and Acts. I know it's been a long road uh, to get through ten lessons without actually getting to the topic. But without these uh, introductory uh, bits of information, you would not understand the Gospels and the Book of Acts when I do present them. So uh, I appreciate your patience in uh, following through with this and uh, not giving up. And hopefully next week we will begin to satisfy your curiosity more than it has been so far and uh, prepare us even better for the study that will come up in a month or two on the search for the spiritual life of the body of Christ. So thank you so much for your uh, attention and let us, uh, let us pray to our Father. Father, we are grateful for the richness of your word, that we can understand your plan for mankind throughout the ages so that we might better understand what your plan is for us in the ages to come. We thank you that you have provided for us a heavenly hope that is different from your chosen people's earthly hope. Just as we uh, pray for them, to come to knowledge of Yahusha HaMashiach in this era, in this dispensation, to become members of your body. We pray for the remnant that will come about through your appearance at the second coming. We are grateful that you have given them that promise and that you will execute your promises without fail and without alteration. We thank you and we bless you in the name of our Savior, 